For years, Natasha Wodak has been seen as someone who found their stride in the 10,000, making three world championship teams, winning Pan Am Gold in 2019, and owning the national event record since 2015. That's why it came as a bit of a surprise when the start list for last December's Marathon Project came out, and Wodak's name was on that list. Nevertheless, when December rolled around, Wodak showed up in Arizona and knocked nearly 9 minutes off her only other attempt at the event, running 2.26.19, good enough for 5th in the race, and 2nd fastest Canadian mark of all time, far surpassing the Olympic qualifying time. We caught up with Natasha earlier this week, and it was all on the table, including growth as an athlete and a human being, and what the future for Natasha Wodak might hold. My name is Michael Rogas, you're listening to The Terminal Mile, and this week we're joined by Olympian and Canadian 10,000 meter record holder, Natasha Wodak. We start off the show by asking Natasha to go back a year and a half. When Rachel Cliff was the national record holder, the trials and the world championships had yet to be run, and asking her if she ever could have pictured a scenario where she would run a marathon and that marathon would displace Rachel's time, but only to become the second fastest Canadian of all time and becoming the fifth woman to score an Olympic qualifying performance, with potentially having even more ready to qualify. We asked her if she could have ever predicted that kind of chaos. Well, of course I knew COVID was going to hit and all this was going to happen, didn't you? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, no. I mean, what has gone on has just been like, you know, crazy. Like there was no... There, I mean, I predicted, yes, that Melindy would run a fast um, marathon, and I knew she would be running under 225. Um, so that, to me, was not a surprise a year and a half ago. If you'd asked me, like, three years ago, maybe I would have told you differently. But um, last fall, um, I knew she was um, she was going to do big things in the marathon, and she did. So um, that was not a surprise. You'd asked me two years ago when Rachel ran 226.57 and broke the Canadian record. I remember, you know, basically saying to people, you know, Rachel has just secured her spot to the Olympics. Like, I'm pretty sure everybody at that point was like, she's locked herself in, right? Like, because she just broke the Canadian record. And, and, and then, you know, you fast forward to now and she's now sort of in that fourth position. And it's just it's crazy how that happened. And, you know, a year and a half ago at this time, I was absolutely, the marathon was not on my radar for the Olympics. Um, and with COVID, it just, you know, everything changed. And so here we are with, and still people have more opportunities to race. So who knows what's going to happen? Crazy year. (laughs) Yeah, you know, yeah. I I was uh, I was talking to uh, to Kinsey Middleton uh, last year on the show, and and she kind of mentioned that uh, that you had uh, reached out to her, and you know we're kind of putting out feelers uh, as far as you know entering yourself into into the marathon project or you know floating that by the organizers there. What what was the whole thought pro- process behind it, and and what led you to that decision that you wanted to to try out the marathon and and run the marathon project? So, I mean, obviously, like, I have been thinking about racing another marathon for quite some time. But the reality was that it, the, the right opportunity never came about. And every summer I would compete at, like, a Worlds or Olympics or Commonwealths in the 10,000. And that time would qualify me for the next year's big race. Like, this seemed to be what happened almost for the last five years. And so... I thought that it would be too risky to try and run a marathon midway through the year and possibly get injured and not be able to train for that next summer's 10,000. And so I just sort of kept putting it off. And, but I really wanted to join the marathon club. Like it's a really awesome group of Canadian women that are just like smashing the marathon. And I wanted to see what I could do, you know, based off of my half marathon time, I thought, you know, I, I could probably run a pretty good marathon. And then when COVID hit and the Olympics were postponed, I thought, you know, like, I, you know, you're turning 39 this year and let's just do it. Like, let's just do it. Life is too short to like keep putting it off and I might get injured and that's a risk I'm willing to take at this point. So we had said, let's look at possibly Houston in January or Tokyo 
in in February or March or something in Japan. And um, but then this came about the marathon project came about in September, I found out and it was 13 weeks. And I, I was like, I don't know if I'll be ready in time. But we were like, yeah, I talked to Lynn and, and my partner and some of my running friends. And they were just kind of like, you know, go for it. Like, the, poss- the chance of, of Houston actually happening or any of these other marathons happening is like up in the air. This is a for sure thing. And so I just was like, yeah, let's do it. I applied and, and Lynn and I wrote, well, Lynn wrote the training, but I had a lot of input into the marathon build, which was really cool. And, and we just went for it. And yeah. So I, I do want to talk a little bit about that because you mentioned it, but in, in 2013, you ran a, a 235-16, uh, which is, you know, by by all accounts, a really solid time. Uh, you mentioned that that you've uh, you've you've run a half marathon that would uh, would definitely lean to uh, to being quite a bit quicker. And of course, you ran that 226-19 uh, at the at the marathon project uh, last year. So. You know, I want to know, obviously, a lot of time passed by and and a lot of running knowledge was definitely gained in that time as well, too. But what was what was the big difference between 2013 and 2020? Oh, wow. I mean, so much. I'm, you know, I just have evolved so much as an athlete and as a person. And um, I'm in a totally different place in my life. And, um, you know, I have a, a I have a different coach, not to say that my last coach was not a great coach, but I have a coach that's that's more in touch with my needs as the athlete I am now and and um, you know, and I'm in a in a better place in my life uh, mentally and emotionally. I was going through a divorce in twenty thirteen. And I found the training really, really difficult and very stressful because I wasn't in a very stable place. I also, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't really been a professional athlete at that point. I was just getting into the game and I was still learning how to, you know, train properly and recover properly. And I've learned all those things in the last seven years. So going into this build, I was a much more mature athlete and I understood, um, what the, the importance of recovery and rest was. And, um, you know, I really trusted my coach and, and the build that we put together and I had a really great support team and, um, and also because I hadn't done the marathon in so long, I was really excited. It felt like something fresh and something new. And, um, that was really exciting in a, in a sport where, you know, it's running, how different can it be? But every event, you know, is different. The training is different. And I really enjoyed doing this, um, doing the marathon training. That, that's really interesting. And there was something that, that you just said that, that I really want to, to focus on. And, and that was about how you are in, you know, su- such a better place now. I mean, like, I, I don't have to tell you and I don't have to tell a lot of our listeners, but, uh, you know, being out there for, for two and a half hours, uh, for running hard for, for two and a half hours, you, there's all, all of a sudden this, this psychological aspect that is, that is just completely, totally uh, amplified, uh, when, when you're running a marathon is how much do you think, you know, having, having good mental health and, and, you know, good stability before, you know, entering into an endeavor like that, how, how much do you think that that really plays into the event? Oh, I mean, it's huge. Um, in the marathon, I, I feel like, especially because you have so much time to, to think and, um, if you let, you know, if, if you have a lot of negativity going on and those thoughts creep in, your body's going to start to slow down. You're going to doubt yourself. And, um, also like if, if you're training and you're training full on for 12 weeks and you're exhausted and you're also going through an emotional battle or you're, or you're just whatever it may be, something else is going on in your life that is causing you large amounts of anxiety or stress, that wears on your body as well. And and you can't train to the level you need to train if you're dealing with these things. And so, I mean, if, if that's what's going on in your training, you're not going to get that result in the marathon. You know, you can try to be as tough as you want, but the truth is 
mental strain causes, you know, for me, physically, I ache sometimes when I'm dealing with things. You're not sleeping, those things. Um, you know, and there's also the aspect of the ment, like on the mental aspect is, sorry, is, is really you have to, you know, work with, if you need to, um, a, a sports psychologist and that can help you in those tough times of races where you may have that self doubt and it gets really hard and, and, and you need to learn how to work through that. And I feel like I'm fortunate over the last seven years to have, you know, been able to work on my mental toughness and, and chat with sports psychologists and really, um, work on that side because it's so much more than just the physical training. You really have to work on the mental toughness, which when the marathon got tough for me at 35 K and you know, my body started to break down, I really had to go to my head and I had to fight. I had to talk myself through it. And, and if I didn't have that fight in me, you know, I, I wouldn't have done the two twenty six nineteen. All right, so so let's let's talk about that fifth overall, which uh, you know, taking a look at that field is uh, is is just uh, just wild and, and such an accomplishment to to get fifth in there. But also the the two twenty six nineteen, like we mentioned as well, number two uh, all time on the Canadian list as well. Not a whole lot of uh, camera time there though, uh, <laughs> g- given uh, given what w- was was happening up front. So you know, I I know a lot of us uh, were certainly watching it, but. Uh, but really, uh, really couldn't follow along w- with your race. So, so talk us through, uh, you know, what, what happened in that race for you? Yeah, the uh, footage wasn't very good from what I've heard, but I did have, um, my friend's partner was there watching Ron and he did a Instagram live on my, on my account. I don't know if you caught any of that. Mm-hmm. So, but then my data stopped at 30 K so it shut <laughs> off for anyone that was watching and wondered what happened. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was very lucky. I had two guys that were pacing what was supposed to be a 226 group, but there was no other women that went with the 226 group. So I ended up having, uh, these two guys, Nick and Will to myself, which was amazing. I was so fortunate and I didn't know that going in. I just knew there was going to be a group, but anyways, um, yeah, so I just stuck on them and I tried to shut my mind off as much as I could and, and save that save that mental um, part for later. And right away, um, we were hitting 328 kilometers, three, you know, in that range. I'm, I wasn't really looking too much because I was taking splits at the 5Ks. And I felt really good. Like I felt smooth and relaxed and that... I felt relieved because I'd been dealing with some issues with some tendonitis in my hamstring and glute. And I was really, I had some struggled through some workouts that were really painful trying to hit that pace and it just wasn't there. And the pace felt really good. And I was like, all right, this is good. (laughs) You can handle this. And I went through the first 5k and I, I wanted to be between like, I think, I think it was like 1715 and 1740 or something like that. And I think we were just a little bit slow, but I thought no big deal. Like that, you know, like it's the first 5k. I'd rather be a little bit slow than too fast. And then, um, yeah, the next 5k was a bit faster and we just kept, you know, hitting the paces and I was, I felt really good and I was, I had no problem getting in my gels and yeah. Um, it, it wasn't until about 35 K that the, the body just started, the wheels started to come off and the pace was no longer feeling, you know, easy. And it went from feeling like pretty relaxed, pretty good to really hard quite quickly. And I knew, you know, I knew that was going to happen. Like I wasn't a fool. Like I knew that no matter how fit I was, it was going to hurt and it hurt. (laughs) And uh, I felt nauseous and I really had to fight that last 7k. And I went through all my mental phrases, you know, swore out loud a few times, like just trying to really concentrate on the things that I could control, like 
what are you doing with your breath? Where are your arms? Where, what, what's going on with your core? Okay. Now just like get to the next K, like look at Nick's bum, stay on Nick, stay on this guy, like let him help you. And so just going through all these things and like, I slowed down a couple seconds per K, but, and I knew I'm like, you can't really slow down much more than like five to 10 seconds per K or you're going to like, you're going to lose it. And that's really scary to think you've done so much work to 35 K and you can lose it all. You know, you can lose so much time because it, it, it can, you can go from running 328 to 345s just like that. Mm -hmm. And that's what my fear was that, that I would hit that point where I really could no longer maintain anything close to that. But I just kept fighting and you know, there's a video of me with 800 to go and I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> like a, that's awful. I'm watching it. And I'm so embarrassed, but at the same time, I'm really proud that I was able to really go to the well and really give it everything that I had. And you know, I I did it, and I fought so hard, and and man, it was tough in those last stages. But you know, I'm glad it was because it meant I gave it everything that I had. I left nothing, nothing. That's no way I could have run any faster. That was all I had, and. uh you know, it was, a, it was a race that I'm one of the, my most proud races in my career, for sure. You know, crossing, crossing the, the finish line at a marathon, it's a, it's a complicated, you know, mix of emotions and, and feelings and that sort of stuff. Uh, you, you mentioned that there's a, there's a video, there's also some, some fairly gnarly, uh, uh, race, uh, r race photos out there as well too. You look like you were, uh, you were certainly in a spot at, uh, at times <laughs> in that race, but you cross the finish line second, uh, you know, all time Canadian, that's that's got to be so good, so, you know, to go along with, with all all that pain and and what you've just put yourself through. Where where were you when you finished that? Uh, when you finished the race, how, you know how how were you feeling? I mean, it's really hard to put into words. Like even thinking about it right now, um, it's just so grateful for for the opportunity to race and to get it done in this freaking year that's just been pretty much disaster. Like. You know, it's just so many, you know, canceled races and and just sadness all around and and it's just been hard. It's been really hard and to get to do that and to get it done meant so much to me and still means so much to me. And um you know, accomplishing a goal always that you set out to do and pushing to a new level is, uh, I don't know. It's just awesome. Like it's been what's getting me through <laughs> the last six weeks, you know, coming down from that's been hard, right? You always say, don't let the highs get too high and the lows get too low. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, the, this past year has been, uh, has been, uh, been tough on all of us. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, one, th one thing that, that really sticks out to me is how you would never have a race with an atmosphere or a course like the marathon project, uh, without it though, you know, just watching from home, it, it just, uh, it was it was a really odd thing to see, and and no doubt it was it was great for for video production and that's that sort of stuff. But uh, still, an odd course layout, uh, very weird with the atmosphere and stuff. So if you could talk a little bit about about that, the the overall environment of the race, what was what was that like for you as a runner? Yeah, you know, um, I the atmosphere I thought was really good. I mean. It was a closed course. It was small, but there were spectators there. And because it was, you know, only this small four mile loop, it did feel like there were a lot of people cheering. Um, and I've never run, you know, I've only run that one marathon back in Toronto. And of course, I've done lots of road races and things and there's spectators, but there's also huge parts of courses that I've done where there's nobody for miles. And so to me, it felt it felt like a regular race. Like it didn't really didn't feel that different than normal. Um, I liked it that it was like a, a looped course and, um, the atmosphere beforehand was a little bit strange with us having to sort of 
not being able to talk to the other athletes before, like, no, I mean, see each other or congregate, right? We all had to stay in our rooms and order food in and that kind of thing. So that was a little different. Um, so one of the things I love best about racing is meeting people. And um, that's what I love about the sport is meeting people from all over the world. And so that, you know, really didn't get to happen. So that's kind of the lame part of all this. But otherwise, I thought the race atmosphere was really great. So this uh, this this kind of puts you in a, a really interesting position uh, now, as you know. I think, uh, and we talked about this, you know, a year and a half ago. You probably had your eye on going to twenty twenty one as a ten thousand meter runner. Now that's not to say that there isn't a ton of time between then and now. Uh, what are the plans now? <laughs> oh yes, the golden question. <laughs> um, it's really hard to say. I've been dealing with a tendon issue since the race, and we really want to um, get me healthy now, and I don't want to rush it at all. Um, so I, I'm only walk running at the moment, and I don't know when I'm going to be healthy enough to start work at workout. So it could be next week. It could be next month. Um but I don't want to pre- put pressure on myself to run fast in early May, like let's say at Peyton Jordan, if I'm not ready. Um, so I have no idea what's going to happen this spring, who's going to run what. Um, I mean, to be honest, like I would, I would love to be on that marathon team. I think it'd be a really special experience to run an Olympic marathon. And I have already run the 10,000 Olympics, so it'd be neat to be able to have said – or just to experience two different events. So I hope that I, you know, I get that opportunity. Um, I'm still going to try and run a fast 10,000, but I just don't know if, um, you know, with all the COVID uh, rules in place, like if I'll even get the opportunity to do that because coming home and having to self quarantine for 14 days in June or July doesn't make any sense. Right. So We'll have to see. Uh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. All right, moving moving on to, to one last question. So I, I I don't know if you caught it, but we had uh, we had Reed Cool set on our on our new animated show. People can check that out on uh, on YouTube. And uh, the whole, we really tasked him with uh, with helping us determine who half of a Canadian marathoners Mount Rushmore would be. Now we're going to do part two of that. We're going to invite uh, on uh, Emily Setlack and we're going to discuss uh, who, which two Canadian women marathoners really deserve a spot up on that Canadian marathoners Mount Rushmore. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Who do you think, which two Canadian women marathoners really deserve, you know, that, that, uh, that immortality, that, uh, that, that spot up on the mountain? Oh, that is a tough question. Um, I have a few names popping in into my head for many different reasons. Um, you know what? I'm I'm gonna go with with what my kind of my heart and my gut says, and I'll have to go with Lani Marchant. I think you know, paved the way back when a lot of women weren't running fast marathons. Lanny started that trend and she broke the Canadian record that had sat for what was it? 28 years, Mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. like that back in, uh, in 2013. And she went on to compete at the Olympics with Krista Duchesne. She did that double. Um, you know, I think that when she ran that Canadian record, and then, you know, went on at the Olympics. It inspired a lot of us to try and run faster. And I know myself, I was very inspired by her. I still am. She continues to fight after being injured on and off for the last four years. And she continues to um, go, get after it and never give up. And I think that's very inspiring. But I think that what she did in the marathon for women is definitely um, iconic. So she would be my number one. Now, number two is hard because I'm t- I'm I have Melindy who I'm thinking of because 
you know, she set that Canadian record and just absolutely, you know, really brought it down to a new level um, in Canada. But I have to go with my girl, Lindsay Tessier, because she did something no other Canadian marathoner has done. She placed in the top 10 at a world championship. And that is iconic. And that is epic. And, um, you know, I was so excited for her. I couldn't sleep that night. It was the night before my own race. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember waking up every hour and checking, you know, every, I checked, I think three times to see on my app where she was. And, uh, yeah, I think that's also incredibly inspiring and iconic to say, you know, not only can Canadian women make these teams, we can place in the top 10 and that's incredibly inspiring to me. So those are my answers. Uh, What do you think? They are fine, fine answers. And, uh, (laughs) You, you know what I think uh, I think some some solid cases could uh, definitely be made for for those runners and having done the draft just the other day I can tell you they probably will be making those arguments as well too I don't want to give too much away here but uh, but uh, definitely look for that as it comes out and I think you uh, you hit it right on the head. Natasha, you are a person with plenty of options now. Uh, you have that Olympic qualifying time. You still have quite a bit of time ahead of you, uh, quite a bit of time to get healthy as well, too. So I wish you, uh, I wish you all the best as far as that goes. And you know, thanks, thanks so much for being on the, on the show today. No problem. Thanks for having me. Big thanks to Natasha for joining us this week and best of luck to her going forward. You've been listening to The Terminal Mile. My name is Michael Rokas and you can find us on all the major podcatchers and YouTube. All that we really ask of you is that you share the love, show your teammates, and drop us a subscribe. Thanks for listening and remember, support your local Twilight Mate.